this century has been described as the Africa century. This may mean different things to different people. But one clear notion that is captured in that description is that Africa is the continent with the greatest material challenges and also the country continent with the greatest opportunities and potentials. Take population, for example, I've heard you know, repeatedly how it is that uh, we will, by 2035, have 1.2 billion people. Nigeria, its most populous country, will become the fourth uh, most populous in the world. Over 50% of that number will be young persons. Some even uh, put that at almost 60% under the age of 25. Today, 60% of the unemployed in Africa are young people. So the implications of this for social upheaval are clear, and we, are, and we see them practically every day. Climate change poses special uh, concerns, especially in desertification. The drying up of the Lake Chad, for example, has, has had you know, incredible implications for security in that area, and of course, on the lives and livelihoods of so many who live around it. The Lake Chad used to be uh, almost uh, 35,000 square kilometers. Today, it is under 1,500 square kilometers. And of course, the implications of that for those who depend on it for their lives or for, for their uh, livelihoods. The challenges of healthcare delivery and education for a large population have also led to the worst human development indices in the world. You know, our continent has uh, some of the worst of those indices. Well, these challenges have peaked, in my view, at an auspicious time, a time when technology and innovation have begun to disrupt older and slower ways of achieving results. And for Africa, a time when its young innovators, the digital scientists and creatives have emerged with such resourcefulness and creativity. There's no question that Africa's future will be determined by innovation. With innovation and technology, Africa will skip or leapfrog, as is often said, over many phases of development, certainly those that other continents and other societies have had to go through. Let me just illustrate very quickly with a few examples, and I'm sure there will be so many that you're already familiar with. We're all familiar, of course, with the success of mobile phones in Africa, and I think we all understand that, you know, uh, there was no other path anyway uh, to reproduce a fixed line telephony system of the 50s to the 80s. This is what develop, developed nations had to do. But we simply skipped that phase and, uh, uh, and uh, we found ourselves very quickly in uh, the mobile telephone era. But on the back of mobile phones have come some of those remarkable leaps. For example, mobile financial transactions, payments, wallets, you know, and all of those, uh, all of those very interesting innovations that would have required the whole infrastructure of banks and other forms of infrastructure just to make them happen. So today, mobile telephony has opened up businesses in rural areas, in Kenya, in Zimbabwe, Nigeria, and led to greater financial inclusion and wealth creation. The birth of some of the exceptionally successful fintech companies, some I'm told will be uh, speaking to us today, have been on the back of mobile telephone. And we, uh, by that I mean the federal government, have used mobile telephony to great effect, especially in uh, the area of deepening microcredits in the rural areas. We've given about 2 million, uh, 2.4 million now microcredit loans to, you know, especially to the bottom of the pyramid in several rural areas. And this has always been on the back of mobile payments, one sort or the other. It would have been impossible or too expensive, far too costly, and we had to go another route. Also healthcare, consider healthcare, what, the, what countries have had to go through. The desired ratio of patients, we are told, is perhaps 500 to one physician, to look at one physician to 500. To reach this ratio would have required 400,000 physicians today in Nigeria. When we are 300 million people, and soon would require another 600 to 700,000. Even if we were not uh, already hemorrhaging physicians to other countries, 
To create this number of physicians is maybe uh, difficult, if not impossible. The only way we'll be able to deliver quality healthcare to Nigerians is through a system where skilled people are augmented with intelligent innovation and technology, including telemedicine, remote sensing, artificial intelligence, etc. Today we have indigenous companies in Nigeria and Rwanda delivering blood to hospitals using drones. In medical care, we're also seeing remarkable innovation. There is a 28-year-old Cameroonian, Abdo Zan, who was featured recently in the CNN uh, Innovations uh, Program, who invented a touchscreen heart monitoring tablet called the CardioPad. It has the potential to revolutionize medicine, especially in remote areas. The CardioPad provides access to healthcare for heart patients in remote areas without taking long journeys to the cities where heart specialists are located. So the tablet is equipped with four electrodes that can be attached to the patient's chest to determine whether their heart is functioning normally or not. The data is then wirelessly transmitted to the cardiopath tablet and sent to a cardiologist who can interpret it and make all of the necessary prescriptions. Similarly, a Nigerian, uh, Osh Adabi, was also featured on the same program. Agabi created a device that can detect cancer cells and even explosives. So the system merges synthetic neurobiology with traditional silicon technology. With the growing threats of security globally, this could even prove to be very revolutionary. But for me, perhaps the most remarkable innovation, especially in the healthcare sector, is that of the work done by our innovation hub in Yola, Adamawa State, the Northeast Humanitarian Innovation Hub. Just last week, a group of interns designed and printed using a 3D printer. And they assembled uh, processes, uh, a processes link for an assistant superintendent of police, Mr. Tumba James, who had lost his arm while on active duty. That was just last week. The interns, Bashir Yao, Suleiman Habib Adam, and Kabir Adam, and uh, their colleagues, were trained in Yola. They worked with a number of volunteers with amputated limbs. The equipment and materials required for the process were all in Yola, and all the work they did was done in Yola. So there is so much opportunity and so much that's been done, and I can just you know go on and on and on. Food security is a great area of need you know, for us in, in Africa and, of course, Nigeria. We can only feed our huge populations with improved productivity from our tens of millions of farmers in, in Nigeria. But this will require access to inputs, but also to accurate information about what to plant, when to plant, how to cultivate. So geospatial and satellite uh, data and access to mechanization on an as-needed basis will be crucial. Also, new ways of increasing productivity are just, you know, we're just going to need all manner of new ways of reducing, of increasing productivity. How about three or four examples of that? But I'll just take the one. Uh, Angela Dillard, I'm sure some of us here are familiar with. She was also recently featured on the BBC World Hacks. She runs a farm called Fresh Direct. The farm uses stacked containers with a focus on supplying premium organic vegetables using hydroponics and vertical farming technology. So Angel is solving the problem of traditional farming using technology and bringing solutions to people's doorsteps. Modular farming uh, for African cities. So, and there are, as I said, so many different examples of what people are doing, especially in the area of technology. And many of these young people have so much, uh, have done so much, just in terms of creating disruptive technology in the agricultural sector in particular. It's also clear that our power problems, the power problems that we have, will be solved by multiples of disruptive innovation. The days of the traditional model of a large grid fed by uh, large uh, power stations are undoubtedly numbered. The smarter and more scalable options are using 
renewable sources of power, solar, wind, biomass, and wastewater power. And the possibilities are limitless. Recently, uh, at the Nigerian Climate Innovation Center, which is also another innovation center backed by the federal government, uh, it's located in, at the LDS, the Lagos Business School, they recently concluded their climate launch pad, and some very innovative ideas were unveiled. One of them, an innovator company called New Digits, generates power from water. The product uses water and conforms solar cells to generate energy for electricity and cooking. So it works by collecting water automatically from any piping channel in the house and breaks down the water into hydrogen, which is used to cook and power the entire house without any need for batteries. So they have the power stove energy, founded also by OK, uh, Abdul, Z, Abdul Aziz, and Glory, which produces a low cost, clean, smokeless cook stove. Power stove energy is the first uh, clean stove to be fitted with uh, self powered, um, a self powered uh, cloud system to monitor in real time a single day of cooking. Any amount of cooking, and of course, any amount of CO2 and biomass that is saved, black carbon prevented, and total electricity is generated. Secondly, Africa is leading the way in a new way of thinking as innovators figure out how to produce power in situ. New story technologies also mean that power is going to be portable for Africa. Of Nigeria's 180 million people, over 20 million households have no power at all. As part of efforts to diversify power sources, we started a program of providing solar power in 20,000 homes in uh, rural villages. And we started that project uh, in a village called Wuna. We now have them in over 20,000 of these homes. Wuna is, just, is a village just outside Abuja. But it's an agrarian community, and it's not, of course, on the national grid and they have no other source of power. To charge their phones in Wuna village, an entrepreneur with a small generator runs a service. So you take your phone to the, to the shop once a day, you pay a small fee for charging, and you know the, this uh, entrepreneur charges your phone using his generator. Life in Wuna used to shut down at exactly 7 p.m. until daylight. But we worked out a PPP model and the government-owned NDPHC partnered with Azuri Technology, a private company, to provide a domestic solar solution. So Azuri provided the same end-to-end -end service that is done in East Africa, which had done a previous model in East Africa, a solar home system, including a payment system. So the solar equipment, all of that solar equipment cost 1,900 a month to pay, about, you know, and every home, has one that's mounted on their roof. And as I said, the total cost of it, that includes the cost of running it you know, on a daily basis, is about just under 2,000 For the first time in its existence, the, solar, the, the, the village now has running water, which is solar power. The school has power. The school hall is now used as a community hall in the evenings. Each home has four points of light. And children, of course, can now stay up and do some studying at night. Many of Wuna's women can also process their millet and yams at night. New jobs have been created for solar installers, maintenance, management of the payment system, etc. Only one guy has lost his job. Uh, that's the phone charger. <laughs> Every household can now, of course, charge their own phones. So. But in much, on a much larger scale, we facilitated a private solar, power supply, private solar power supply to markets across Nigeria using new extra power lithium cells. So we have uh, solar power now in the Sabongari market in Kano, in Arere market in Aba, in the Sura market in Lagos, Isiko in Ondo, the two other markets uh, in, in Ondo, and Bagi market in Oyo State. All of these are now you know, economic clusters powered uh, by solar using uh, solar power, but also all private, and everyone is happy to pay. Everyone is happy, and of course, it's so much cheaper than uh, 
uh, fuel uh, than uh, fuel powered uh, generators and all that. Algeria, for example, has also, you know, I mean, talking again about innovations in Africa, has created over 3,500 jobs in the construction of just a 14 grid connected solar uh, PV project with 700 permanent jobs that are expected uh, to come into operation uh, once uh, the, the, the project is completed. Kenya has built Africa's largest wind farm at, at Lake uh, Tokana, providing 310 megawatts of power, reliable power, low cost energy, and all of that. And this, of course, uh, they put on their national grid. 15% of the country's installed capacity is solar power now. Its construction alone created about 2,000 local jobs. So there are all manner of opportunities uh, around uh, innovation. Education for us, of course, offers new, uh, all sorts of new uh, opportunities for innovation. Our median age is about 18. This means 100 million young people, 18 or under, they need to get educated and a higher quality, of course, than we're providing today. They also need relevant training for new opportunities being created uh, by technology and innovation. The only way to deliver education on this scale is through technological innovation that can deliver the best curriculum by the best teachers to the highest number of young people. And there is no other way of doing it on scale except with technology. We've seen, we've experimented with uh, how to use technology on scale in this way. Uh, with our Empower program, we engage 500,000 uh, graduates who work as teachers, some as farm extension workers, some as public health uh, workers. About the first 250 of them, 250,000 of them, take the have tablets uh, such as this one that I'm holding here. And the tablets have uh, a huge number of training material. The training material from entrepreneurship training to code writing, programming, etc. But, but also, we have an open portal for all of the beneficiaries of the Empire program, so they, so they can actually get onto that open portal and take a lot of the material that they need. But we've also, we, we were also able to uh, do practically everything concerning these 500,000 people online practically from, from recruiting them to paying them every month, and also to monitoring uh, what they're doing. All of it is done online. So it is entirely possible for us to train hundreds of thousands of people, now we're, and we're adapting this to training of teachers, to teacher training and retraining. We're also seeing that innovation is uh, bringing us you know, so many uh, other advantages. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the, uh, about the teacher training and all that, so I don't keep you here for my threatened one hour. I see that a few people are already not enough. And trust me, I will, I will not stop until the last one falls asleep. <laughs> <laughs> because, but because technology allows information to be spread to more Nigerians more quickly, you know, uh, where we see, of course, that it's also helping governance. I mean, technology helps governance no matter what uh, anyone says. And I'm not talking about uh, computerizing uh, the whole of government facilities or digitalizing it in any way. I'm talking more about just holding people to account because you know now it's very difficult to do anything without being caught on camera somewhere and you know, being, posted onto, uh, uh, being posted onto one platform or the other. And I, I think this is I think this is good. You know, I think this is a good thing. I mean, every day at least, some of us, uh, I uh, included, get insulted practically every day on Twitter for stuff that you did wrong, and many times stuff you don't even know anything about. <laughs> but you know, it's all good. I think it's better uh, than not being able to hold politicians to account. I'm sure that uh, there will be a lot of talk about blockchain technology, and this is something that uh, we're already seeing in Nigeria, which is, you know, I think is incredible. And uh, it's already here. We, the other day, I think uh, 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 both um, uh, Dan Gote and uh, the, uh, I, I'm trying 
can't remember the name of the of the company. Uh, it's both Dangote and uh, I'm not so sure what the name of that payment company is. I've already started innovating in uh, blockchain uh, technology, especially for financing supply chain uh, for supply chain financing in particular. So we're already seeing a lot of innovation around uh, that. It's Interest, which is the name of the company. So they're already doing uh, quite a bit of work. So here today, uh, we have, I'm told, uh, several innovators from uh, agrotech to uh, medicine, from med medical uh, healthcare to fintech, etc. So you really will see, I think, uh, that there's just an enormous impact that innovation is already making in Nigeria and, of course, in Africa. And I have no doubt that this culture of innovation in Africa and Nigeria is not, uh, will be the game changer, and that it will set in what will make the real difference in meeting the challenges that uh, Africa and, indeed, uh, Nigeria is facing. Yeah, uh, and, and I'm sure that uh, it just by looking at what is going on already, and I've paid quite a bit of attention as, as, as an individual to so many of the different things that are going on everywhere. And I think that there is no question at all that just given the right environment and given some encouragement, a lot of what we are uh, seeing today we will we'll see in multiples and a great deal of the problems uh, that we talk about as if they have no solution will be very, very quickly solved indeed. Finally, let me commend uh, the founders of the Africa Institute for very hard work and sacrifices to uh, get the institute launched. As you heard, the Africa Institute is dedicated to provide skills development to managers, to policy makers, and uh, to leaders in, in government, in techniques of good governance, in the context of the African society. And I'm particularly delighted that the uh, Institute has made innovation a core pillar. I also understand that a second pillar of the African Institute is a moral foundation for our public sector leaders, both politicians and civil servants. And I would extend that to uh, all private sector players as well. We're not the only sinners in this business, <laughs> just political politicians, you know, everyone. It certainly needs a moral uh, foundation. Innovation and moral foundation are two powerful forces that will not just propel Africa forward, but will ensure that our progress will endure. Congratulations to the Africa Policy Institute, especially Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Andrew Nevin and uh, Mr. Yemi Cardoso on this first of the very many uh, Kalisto Juma gatherings. Thank you all very much.